I'm Bob Peel, and I'm your master of ceremonies today. That means I get to cut people off when they talk too long, and when I feel like... <laughs> Somebody call the technical crew. It's time. And when I feel like talking, you're going to have to listen to me. Um, but we have a very special thing to start off today, and that is uh, last year's Living Legend recipient, Suzanne Tate, is going to come up and read us the words of a song that was written by Eve Tro Turek a few years back. And if any of y'all remember, Eve spent many years working on the Oregon Inlet Jetty Project for the county. Uh, but it was a song written about Moon Tillet. Is that correct? So we're going to start the day off and set the mood with that if we can. Miss Tate, if you'll come on up. Last year's living uh, legend recipient, y'all. When I heard about this song, I just knew that uh, it ought to be uh, at least read to Moon today. Uh, Eve Tro Turek, a very good friend of mine, uh, wrote the, the song, and uh, Judy Bailey wanted to sing it to you today. But uh, she's been a little under the weather, so the best thing to do is, is read it, because it really is, is priceless. Moonbeam on the water shines the path home. It's the gallant fox that knows the ways of the moon. Never mind pretending, let the rest roam. Then the gale is humming a homeward tune. Moonbeam on the water shines the path home. Moonbeam on the water knows the sand trap. Trading tricks are found as the channel twists and shifts. Swifter than the lightning when the clouds clash gentle as a morning when the fog lifts. Moonbeam on the water shines the path home. The days of a man are told in his hands, dream and a plan that the heart understands. Honesty is long as the sea to the shore. Let the wind never be wrong. Let the bar leave a door. Moonbeam on the water shines the path home. Moonbeam on the water hands the ways down legacy of living by the wind and the wits, selling, sailing off the edge to find the line, round bounty, sure as breathing, don't call it quits. Moonbeam on the water shines the path home. Thank you, Miss Tate. We appreciate that. Moonbeam on the water. That's the theme for today. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to, now we're going to go ahead and go into lunch, so I'd like to ask uh, our living legend recipient from two years ago, I believe, Captain Omi Tillett, to come up and give us the invocation. And after this, we'll go right into lunch, and then the program will start after everybody starts eating. Greet everybody with a hug. Howdy, buddy. Howdy, buddy. Howdy, buddy. Well, I'm excited up here to, to pray. I need the practice, folks. And this is where you get it. I reckon that's where you start, isn't it? Huh? Hey, Moon, I got thinking about that fish. How big is that one, that dolphin? That's 45. I had one 75 one time. <laughs> huh? Did you see him? Did you see oh, that? Did you see that thing? And I lost my picture. I don't know what got it. You let people have pictures, but you don't get them back. That's one thing. Well, don't say that. We haven't returned these yet. You did. <laughs> well, that's a reminder for you to do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I tell you, folks, I'm glad to be here and see old friends and all, and especially Moon. We grew up together. Here I am going to talk, so you can cut me off any time. Hallelujah. My wife is getting hungry. I hear her guts growling from here. <laughs> hey, and, hey, I got to talk. I can't help it, man. <laughs> huh? I said, yeah, you just will sit down. The food won't get cold. <laughs> if the food gets cold, it'll warm it up when we put it in. It won't make no difference, would it, man? But anyway, we went to uh, <clears throat> Where was it, Patsy? Up there somewhere. 
my mind about it is lost. We went to up there in Pennsylvania. Huh? Come on, where did we go? Pennsylvania, that's good enough. Anyway, we went to Pennsylvania, a group from our church, you know, and uh, they asked me to pray that morning over the food. Well, I got praying. Seemed to me like it was going kind of long. The Lord was giving me things to say. If He gives you any things to say, you've got to do it. But my wife was, it didn't fit in with her. She was hungry. In fact, I could hear her belly growling. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Lord, I got a signal. I got to quit. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. Folks, <clears throat> I'll tell you, I like to pray, but I, but I wish I could do it better. But I, I need this practice, and that'll help me maybe. But anyway, it's good to be here today, and I'm excited in it. I'm excited in Jesus. Hallelujah. I like to, I like to tell it everywhere I go right now. Bubbling over. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't help it. I'm boiling over. Woo! Shield so over. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I got cream of fruit. It, it's filling up, buddy. Anyway, then, Jesus, we just love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for going to the cross for us, God. You, we, we, we are blessed folks, Lord. And we come here today, God, recognizing Moon for his, for all he's done for the fishing and everything. He's always there to help people. And just, uh, if we will, He's he done a good job. Hallelujah. And now, Lord, we come to thank you now for the food that everybody's prepared for us here. And God, we ask you to bless bless everything in, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. That was short, wasn't it? Hallelujah. <laughs> How you like that, Mom? <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to have lunch, and then we'll start the program in just a little bit. Y'all enjoy your lunch. Uh, we're here today to honor a very special individual, and uh, I asked him, in sitting down with him last week, I asked him a question that after all these years that I've known him, I can't believe I never asked. And maybe I was worried that I might get some sort of off-color answer or something. I don't know why I didn't ask this. I remember riding down the road right after Moon Tillet Fish Company had bought a big 18-wheeler. This was a few years back. And it passed me, and I didn't know they had bought it. And I see this moon tillet emblem go by. And then I'm going, and as it passes me, and it's in front of me, I, I see something on the back. I, I think it said, smile, you've just been mooned. I don't think that stayed on the truck very long. I think that was painted over pretty soon. But so when I asked Moon the obvious question, I was a little worried, what am I going to hear back? But because I'm up here telling the story, it, it is obviously very... Fine, a fine story to tell. Moon, where did you get the name Moon? That's a pretty uncommon. Uh oh, <laughs> maybe there are different versions of this story. And uh, so he told me. He said, "Well, he said um, he told me when he was very young, he used to sit on the front porch of their house in the evenings and carry on a conversation with the moon." Now this was when he was little. And he didn't just do this once in a while. He did this, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but he did this on a regular basis. So I thought about it for a minute, and, and in, now that I've thought about it a little more, and, and he did that so much, actually, the family, his family parents called him Moon from that day forward, and it has stuck. So, you know, I've heard of moonshine, moon pies, moon lighting, moon blindness, shooting the moon, Crying for the moon, once in a blue moon, man in the moon, and casting beyond the moon, and other such phrases. But quite honestly, moon, I have never heard of anyone sitting there having a serious conversation with the moon night after night. You are definitely one of a kind. So I look forward to our speakers. We've got a great uh, group of folks up here that are going to speak, and it's my honor right now to introduce Mike Murray who is our superintendent of the National Park Service up here. He's going to welcome us real quick.
Mr. Tillett, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, nice to see you on this beautiful April afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this Living, Len Living Legend Luncheon, try saying that real quick, Living Legend Luncheon on behalf of the National Park Service. The history of the Outer Banks resolves, revolves around humankind's interactions with the area's dynamic and sometimes harsh coastal environment and weather. It's a coastline with a legendary name, Graveyard of the Atlantic. It's a history that includes the first attempt at English colonization of the New World with the famed Lost Colony. It's also a story that spans many generations and includes a rich local tradition of lighthouse keepers and life-saving station surfmen. In the early 1900s, the Wright brothers came to the Outer Banks to first test their glider and then later to fly their heavier-than-air powered airplane. It was wind, sand, and remoteness that brought the Wright brothers to the Outer Banks, but it was the people who lived here, particularly the surfmen of Kitty Hawk and their families, that kept them coming back. The story of Outer Banks and its history, which continues to be written today, is not complete without the inclusion of the pioneering commercial fishermen who created an industry that lives on today. So it's very fitting that the Roanoke Island Historical Association has selected Moon Tillett as this year's living legend. So I congratulate Mr. Tillett, very well deserved, on his selection for this honor and uh, hope that you all will have an enjoyable luncheon. Thank you. I had to run back to my seat. I forgot the schedule of who's supposed to speak. So, um, If you've ever traveled with Moon Tillet anywhere, see, I told you you're going to get stuck with me talking. Have you ever traveled with Moon Tillet anywhere? It's always a very interesting time. Over the years, I've learned through these conversations in vehicles that uh, Pamlico County fishermen were always called, is it Woodsers or Wooders? because they grew up in the woods in Pamlico County. Carteret County or Core Sound fishermen were always called onion eaters in the old day when they came up here because they always had strapped to the cabins of their boats bags of onions. I guess they liked to eat onions. One time on the way to Washington, D.C., Moon and Eve O'Neill, Mr. O'Neill's from Hatteras, uh, had a conversation or a debate about whether or not it's true or not that boys are always born on ebb tide, girls are always born on flood tide. So it's just amazing what you hear. And by the way, I checked last week, my, that's right for my kids. They were born on the right tides. So. Um, but you, it's always amazing what you hear and just the conversations when you're driving the van or riding in the van to D.C. on one of those Oregon Inlet trips, for example, and what you hear in the back. Um, it's always amazing. I want to introduce our next speaker. Um, he really needs no introduction in this area. Um, he has been around in the political scene in Dare County for many, many years, and uh, I suspect he has known Moon for quite a long time, too. So I would like to introduce Mr. Bobby Owens. Bob, you had me worried when you talked about the uh, county van going to Washington, D.C. I said, stop right there. Don't go no further. And he didn't. <laughs> what do you say about a person that you've known all your life just about? Moon, we all know him. Bumbaloo, I've gone through life calling him Bumbaloo, his children Bumbaloo, his grandchildren Bumbaloo, and... That's what they all are synonymous with me is fishing and the water. Uh, Moon has been through three or four boats. He's still got two now, I think. Uh, the Bumbaloo, the Ranger, the John Duke, and finally he's got two others. I don't know the name of them because they're having such a hard time getting in and out of the inlet. They're named up here in Virginia now. Uh, but we'll get through that too. Moon and I go back to a little right in here, two or three of, you, three of you might remember what I'm talking about. We go back to the Casena Barbara Shanty days. Moon. Look at Moon smiling. Uh, the Casena back in the old days is where you went to bowl and buy an orange crush. 
And then Barbara Shanty, that was where all the shrimpers and the fishermen got together to tell sea stories over coffee. And that was just about it. And we're going to stop there on those two. <laughs> but I, I have known Moon for a long time. A dear friend will say this is one of the most fitting days today for a person that I have known that's worked his whole life to give back to people. Moon has been working on the Oregon Inlet Project for at least 66 years. We, we hear reading the papers, 50 years, it's 40 years. Well, 1946 is when the project first started. I can tell you. I wasn't there, but I know what these guys did. Willie Etheridge's daddy, uh, Moon, just a, a bunch of them. But uh, I... Uh, I just want to say it's a proud honor up here. I'm not going to talk long, not supposed to, to, to be a part of this occasion and to, to honor Moon and uh, his sons and his grandsons and his family, his children. They have worked all their lives, all of them, trying to earn a living and earn it right and honestly from that blue water right out there. And uh, I'm proud to have known Moon till it, and I hope we get to know each other and know, hang around for a long time. Congratulations, Moon. I mentioned earlier how Moon used to talk to the moon. That's funny. Moon talked to the moon. Um, and that close relationship and bond, I guess, he formed with the moon, how fitting that is for a commercial fisherman. We all know how important the moon is to our weather and how important weather is to fishermen. I've learned over the years that if you want to know the weather report and what's actually going to happen, give Moon a call. I remember a few years ago, my brother was supposed to come down to go fishing on a Saturday. He called, called me to make final plans and mention how the weatherman was predicting a really great weather for that Saturday. But then early the next week, it was going to turn really ugly. I just happened to speak to Moon that day. He doesn't probably remember this, but I happened to speak to him that day. And he said, Peel, <laughs> it's going to blow a gale. It's going to be ugly Saturday. You're not going to be able to go fishing. I said, well, we'll see. So sure enough, that Saturday morning, I was sitting at the cottage with my brother on the front porch watching the bottom just fall out and the wind howling. And I just looked at my brother and said, I told you Moon said it was going to rain. I told you next time you want to know the weather, call a commercial fisherman. And sure enough, they know. They know about that. Um, with that, I want to bring up a commercial fisherman up here to say a few words about Moon. Uh, Will Etheridge and his family have been in the uh, commercial fishing business here in Dare County and Wine Cheese for generations. And so, uh, Willie, will you come on up and say a few words? Well, I'm going to start out by apologizing. <laughs> so when I get, by the time I get through, I'm sure I'll be so nervous I'll just go sit down. But, uh, <laughs> I want Moon and his family to know that I really, really love that man. And it's very, very hard for me to stand up in front of a bunch of people and talk. Uh, if we were in a bar room and we were roasting him, I could be the <laughs> center of attraction, but I'm, I'm just not good at public speaking. Uh, but I do love Moon and I appreciate getting the opportunity to say a few good things about him. I can remember him from the time I can remember. Uh, my father was a charter boat fisherman and Moon was a charter boat fisherman and my dad started taking me when I was eight years old. I, ha I had to go. I didn't necessarily always want to go. And it was always great to see Moon there. He, he was always kind to me. My dad was a little hard on me. Moon would take the time to explain things to me and I, I just, just developed a fondness for him and, and always enjoyed being in his company. And our life really started to run a real close parallel because he started Moon Tillet Fish Company about the same time that I restarted Willie Etheridge Seafood Company. And him being a, close to a generation ahead of me, I could always go to him and, and he could, would instill confidence in me. He, he would uh, say, Good things about me. He wasn't putting me down. Uh, I, any of you guys that's ever fished know you all fishermen are always putting the fish dealers down. 
uh, and, and we, you know, our businesses grew, and uh, Moons grew, mine grew. We worked together on a daily basis. It was seven days a week. You could always bet that Moon was going to be there to his fish house. And if you needed some advice, something broke down, he was the guy you would go to. Um, he, he has a gift of rigging things. That's a mill landing term, but Moon's about as good at it as anybody that I know. And he, he wasn't uh, shy. He would make his suggestions to you. And just like Bob told you about the weather, they, they would just about always be right. I know that I look out here and I see a lot of people. I see Dane there. I, I, I see a lot of people, James, that, that know him and dealt with him on a daily basis. And I'm sure they all could do a better job talking up here than I can. But I did take it upon myself this morning to contact a few people and ask them if they had anything that they would like me to say. And the one thing that um, the, one of the first people that I contacted was his son, Craig, and I said, Craig, you got anything you'd like for me to say about your daddy? And he thought for a minute and he said, he loves his family. And folks, that's a man right there that loves his family. And he showed it all of his life. And, and we all that have children like to build relationships and stuff with those children, but I, I know I didn't do quite as good a job with mine as Moon did with his. And, and uh, I, I know that things in the fish business today are just, it's just really, really bleak as it could possibly be. And it's nothing that Moon did. It's nothing that Willie did. It's just regulations. The stuff's been jammed down our throat from the fish, from the uh, people, the powers to be, the people that make the regulations. And, and uh, I, I know that it's a struggle and, and some of us might not get through the struggle, but I, I, I just can't help but bring this fact up because nobody can fully understand the picture of what's going on with the commercial fishing industry right now. But, but one thing is we, we are both active members in a North Carolina Fisheries Association. And that North Carolina Fisheries Association has survived financially because a lot of the fish companies and the fishermen have agreed to pay one half a percent from the boat and one half a percent from the fish house into this association to help us fight for our, our different problems that we have with the bureaucracy, the reg regulators. And just, just to bring up one instance, and, and I know we should be having happy times here, not sad times, but there was 1.6 million pounds of Flanders unloaded in Virginia that should have come to North Carolina, but they could not because they could not get through Oregon Inlet. That 1.6 million pounds of Flanders at $2 a pound is 3.2 million, and you take 1% of that, and that's $32,000 that was taken from the North Carolina Fisheries Association. Just one species of fish. So we do have a, 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 a lot of, uh, problems in our industry today and, and we, we ask you to look into it. You know, one of the things that I, I called Jimmy Rule and I asked Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, is there anything you want to say? He said, Will, just think about Moon taking the troll boat to the Shriner conventions, putting it in the parades. It's a positive thing about commercial fishing. We're just surrounded by so many negatives, but that's a positive thing. And Moon did every bit of that all on his own. He's taken the time. He's put, he's put the effort, and I'm quite sure he's had to take quite a bit of money out of his pocket to, to go and do this, but he's doing it for the industry, and, and the industry's I know I'm indebted to him. I'm, I'm sure the whole industry is indebted to him. And, and uh, he's, it's just one thing after that. I, I talked to Sneed this morning. I, as Sneed said... Will, with his handicap, just look how hard he's worked. Look what he's been able to produce. Oh, I got somebody's name down there. I can't even read my own writing. I talked to, uh, I swear I can't read my own writing. I, I asked James, I, I tried to get up with James. James says, 
you know, one of the first things that comes to his mind is when, when back in the early charter boat days, there was hardly any marine electronics, and, and Moon was one of the first ones. He got a Loran. Now, Loran is a, it's all just turn a switch on now, but those days you had to turn a switch on and go through about 10 or 15 minutes of preparatory work and then try to get your position. And Moon would make sure that every afternoon when they got ready to go back to the dock, the guys would know where they were. He's just done one thing after the other, and, and uh, again, I kind of wish we were in a bar and I could roast him a little bit, but <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll stop here and just tell him that I do love you, Moon. Appreciate you. Moon has spent a lot of time over the last several years uh, with the Shriners. Uh, if any of you know, he, he does go to the parades and things like Will said. Spends an awful lot of time uh, with that group. So to kind of, I think, sort of address that, we have uh, Judge Jerry Tillett here today. Jerry. Thank you. It, it's always a, a great opportunity to be here among such people as, uh, as Moon and, and also to share the dais with people of the caliber you've got here today. This is a special occasion because of the affinity I have for Moon. Like Will, I've known him all my life. It's a most auspicious occasion because we uh, get to honor and recognize not only somebody who is indeed a legend in his own time, but is very colorful. He's one of Dare County's favorite sons. For me, this holds special significance then because he's been a mentor to me, he's been a friend, he's a fraternal brother, and he's also a cousin. It's also a rare opportunity for me to be with people that, who are also living, whom I greatly admire. Now, I've mentioned these names before, so you know I'm telling the truth. But when Moon called me and said that these other people were going to be here and speaking, I said, well, Moon, you don't need me. I tried to beg off, and I said, with the caliber of people you've got, you, you really need to let me out because I'll just dis detract. It'll just detract from the significance and importance of this, of this event. And being the perfect gentleman, he tried to, tried to make me feel better, and he said, well... We need a little bad with the good. <laughs> and in that similar vein, and that the other speakers have already had the opportunity to say many of the things I was going to say, I will tell you that uh, it reminds me of a story of a young preacher who was sent, Brother Omi, to uh, call to a church out in the mountains of North Carolina. And he was a young man, wanted to make a good impression, so he went out to everybody he could find, every field, Every little cow pasture, every country store, he invited everybody to a great sermon meeting he was going to have coming up. And then he went and he prepared. And he prayed and he studied and he prayed. And he got a great sermon prepared. But the night before, a great snow came and covered everything. So the next morning, only one man showed up. He was very disappointed, didn't know what to do. And he finally jumped down and asked the man what he thought. The man said, well, I'm just a farmer. I don't know about all that, but I believe if I hitched up my wagon, loaded it up with hay, went out to the field, feed my cows, and only one cow showed up, I'd feed her. Thinking that was his sign, he jumped back up in the pulpit, and he began to preach. And he preached, and he preached. And about two hours, two hours later, he stopped, and he went back and asked the man what he thought. And the man said, well, preacher, I told you I'm a farmer, and if I loaded up my wagon with hay, went out in the field to feed my cows, and only one cow showed up, I'd feed her but I wouldn't give her the whole dang load. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to. As many things as I'd like to say, I'm not going to try to. I'm going to try not to give you the whole load. Now this story about Moon Tillett could easily have been an Ernest Hemingway novel. When I first was talking to Moon, I said, where should we begin? And he said, well, at the beginning. So on... December 17, 1929, in the southern end of Roanoke Island, near the cutting sedge, the place where they cut net stakes, born to Lenny Bass Knight and Billy Tillett, was a special boy, Gilbert Roscoe Tillett. Hardly nobody knows that name. 
Now his father had a penchant for giving names. He had also, who was named Leslie Roscoe, had given him that name. He had also named himself Billy. I guess Leslie didn't sound right for him. But that name just wouldn't do. And as Bob said, he got his nickname by which everyone really knows him. From staring at the moon and calling it my Mr. Moon. He didn't just talk to it, he claimed it. Ownership. It was about that same time that, and before the vaccinations, that he was afflicted with the polio. One leg is shorter. But it didn't stop him. He attended Wan Chi school, and like the others, he walked to school back and forth, usually barefoot. He finished the eighth grade, and then it came time for him to go to Mania. But times were tough, and there was adventure, and there was money to be made out there working like grown men. So Moon in the ninth grade left school. But not before Miss Inge, that legendary matriarch who had guided many a miscreant, made her indelible mark upon him. He says she was my favorite. She tried to straighten me out, but she couldn't do it completely. He went to work on an oil tanker for Texas Oil. He was working on a seismograph ship. They were searching for oil, and the process involved dropping dynamite charges on the bottom and taking pictures. And it depended on a lot of precise timing and communication. And one day they had a substitute supervisor. And communications were not as they should be. And Moon had to witness his mentor and his older friend, Ross Rotillet, as he was blown up. He and Buddy Boo Gallup had to row about in a boat and retrieve body parts and dismembered leg. Moon says, that was my worst experience. Now, there's something about learning from experiences and time. And there's a story of an old farmer who got behind so he didn't pay his taxes and they sent him to prison. And his wife wrote him a letter and said, she was trying to keep everything going. She said, when do we plant the potatoes? He wrote her back, realizing that the prison officials monitored all mail, saying, not now. And whatever you do, don't dig in the back field, because that's where I buried all the money. <laughs> a few days later, his wife wrote him again and said, Homer, you're just not going to believe this. The strangest thing, a few days ago, 40 federal agents came, and they dug up every square inch of that back field. He wrote her back by return mail. Now is the time to plant potatoes. <laughs> This lesson of timing is something Moon learned, learned at a very early age. After the tragedy on the tanker, Moon realized that it was time for a new job. He started a career with the party boat fishing, recreational fishing. This was something that I believe Omi's dad, Sambo, had started. And he would book the parties through the legendary Sam and Omi's restaurant. And Moon's dad, Billy, who also run a store in wine cheese. When he had a party, he just closed the doors. There was time for that. When his father died, Moon took over the party boat, and he was one of the first to move to Oregon Inlet, which was what to begin a famous fleet. And his first boat, as you've heard, was the Bumbleu. She was about, only about 15 to 20 feet, wasn't she, Moon? 33. 33, okay. It's nothing like the 80 footers you see now. This, of course, as Bob says, gave rise to the nickname by which Dane and some others will always call him. Next boat you see in the picture over here was the Ranger. His mate was Billy Daniels, a person who went on to become a captain of large ships. Moon also worked sometimes on the tugboat with uh, Rossi Beasley and Raymond Westcott. But in 1965, he started the commercial fishing. That's when he bought the John Duke. 
She was used for shrimping, even lobstering up in New York. After running the John Duke successfully all up and down the coast, his first son was coming of age, Billy Carl, so he bought another boat. This was the Linda Gale. And later, when his second son was coming of age, they bought the Gallant Fox. She was named after a racehorse. In between the boats is when he started the fish house, and appropriately, he called it Moon Tillet Fish Company. Moon speaks of the boats, the vessels, with a certain special tone of voice. It's almost like they were a part of the family. He had a vision, perhaps from his name, and he had a joy and an insight into this vis business. He was the first to do the quick freeze for squid to make the seafood fresher, quicker. Like others, he grew up precociously. He was driving in automobiles since he was 10 years old. Working, was able, he was able to make money, so he was one of the first ones around to buy a car. That car was a source of independence and stature. He says he taught just about everybody in wine cheese to drive in that car. My mother and Annie Green, married to, formerly was to Edward Green, one night as a prank while he had it parked, they just decided to paint it, and they painted it with paintbrushes. <laughs> and that would have enraged just about anybody else, but he just laughed. He used to sell oysters out of that car for extra spending money. But at age 14, he and the Daniels boys, Gene and Dick, and Bill Hardesty were on a venture, a tear or whatever, in East Main Street in Norfolk. You can figure that out for yourself. <laughs> now, Moon was very young, but he had the car. Someone come up with the idea that they should just leave. They should go to Florida, start a new life, a new career. So they did that night. They got the tarpon strings with a new venture. They were going to be sponge divers. They had learned to swim in the Mill Landing Creek and were pretty good at it. But when they got to Tarpon Springs, there was no jobs. It was not the time for sponge diving. So they tried to make it back home. They got as far as Jacksonville, Florida. My dad had rebuilt the engine just before they left, but it still burned 39 quarts of oil milk, Moon said. <laughs> in Jacksonville, they had no money. They were gorging around for food picking up cigarette butts. Moon remembered he had $25 left in his savings. He wired to his dad, his dad wired him the money, and with that $25, they were able to make it back to Wanchese, North Carolina. But his father was very quick to remind him that if he hadn't have had that $25, he'd still be in Jacksonville. <laughs> it's another lesson that he learned. One night they were fishing in Englehard, Charles Scarborough, had been out on Long trip, come in early in the morning, and they had their last five dollars and sent Charles to get some breakfast, some eggs. Well, when he was late, they finally realized that being out on a fishing boat for a long time, it was not the time to send Charles Scarborough to the store for eggs. <laughs> he came back with a fifth of liquor, and that was the only breakfast. <laughs> early on in one of his fishing trips in Englehard, there was a somewhat famous dance hall called the Pop Arena. That was astute since it was situate on Popping Creek. The owner also owned a restaurant and served the best ice cream, the boys said. One afternoon, Moon and boys were in there, and Moon happened to see a young girl. She was the owner's daughter. She was sitting in a booth caught his attention, and he was moonstruck then. <laughs> that night, the other boys went to the Pop Arena to dance hall, but Moon went back to the restaurant. And he walked straight away up to her, and the first words he said was, you want to get married? <laughs> and she said, yes. <laughs> now, you might think that's a bit brash or impetuous, but for someone who's already claimed the moon, there was little time to be wasted. She was with him until she died of cancer. And in the 90s, she became sick and Moon decided it was time 
turn that business over to his son, grandsons. But it wasn't long, Moon always on a mission, before another person struck his eye or was caught in the glimmer of the moon. At her daughter's wedding, Jean Curls, who had caught the bouquet, and Moon arranged to be the one to put the garter on her leg. And that was all it took. Soon thereafter, she became the new Miss Moon Tillett. And she's been with him, his constant companion on those long trips, those shrine ceremonials, all around the state and wherever. She likes to shop. He hates it. But he sits there, <laughs> smokes his pipe, and waits. I would say Moon is characterized by a sarcastic wit, an infectious smile, a mercurial laugh, a tenacious will, straight, direct talk, gregarious, yet non-affectatious. He hates pretense. He hates putting on airs. Yet he's equally at home and poised, speaking with senators or lobbying governors or teasing the young boys at the Shrine Club. Like another mutual friend of ours who's gone on before, what you see is what you get. Being genuine, he exemplifies that motto precious to us all. Esse quam wadere, to be rather than to seem. While he's been involved with many avenues of service to his community, to his state, to his industry, serving on the Oregon Inlet Commission, lobbying, he's also been involved as a mason and as a shriner. He raises money for the 22 crippled hot crippled children hospitals and hospitals that provide medical care without charge to young men and women in the military or children. The polio never slowed Moon. He can hang with the best and the youngest and the roughest of the young Shriners. He is indeed a legend in that field as well. He's had many successes, but I think he'll tell you, as he did me, that his fondest memories were those of recreational fishing. Because the season was short in those days, he had to find other ways of making money. He tried the tugboat a bit. One time after the summer, he was contemplating returning to the tugboat, but he was still torn. He even drove up to Norfolk and met with a manager who said he'd love to have him back, but he asked the question, come spring, what are you going to do? Moon just smiled thanked the man, and returned home. He helped me make up my mind, Moon said. He knew that fishing was calling. It was perhaps what he was born for, as if it was the natural order of things. The sea always held a special place and affinity for Moon and its creatures. The rich waters of the Gulf Stream provided a cast of characters and influences on Moon's life with which he had interacted. His travels and ventures never took him to the moon yet, but they took him through business, many vessels, up and down the East Coast from Florida to New York and Maine, providing seafood all over the world. He had a course, and he always found his way. Hemingway wrote a Pulitzer-winning novel about the relationship between a man, the sea, and recounts an epic search for and a battle between a fisherman and a great marlin. The Hemingway character states confidently, I'll just steer south and west. A man like me is never lost at sea. As the great marlin is finally hooked and the battle begins, the character says, now is the time to think of only one thing, that which I was born for. Perhaps I shouldn't have been a fisherman but that is what I was born for. The fish is my friend. Never seen or heard of such a fish, but I must catch him. I am glad we do not have to catch the stars. Can you imagine if each day a man must try to catch the moon? He thought the moon flies away. Moon nostalgically tells me that the best day of his life, the best day was when he caught that big marlin. 425 pounds on the ranger, barefoot, single-handedly he hauled it into the boat. And with such force that the marlin flew all the way across 
and embedded its bill in the other side of the boat all the way through the hull. He put up a fight, but that was the most fun I ever had, Moon said. I've not attempted to write creatively this story or embellish it. This is Moon's story. The events are related by him. These are the events and the people he thought important to mention. Hemingway wrote that his goal was to create a real old man, a real fish, and a real sea. Perhaps the story of Moon Tillett is the story of a real man, real fish, and a real sea, the stuff of which legends are made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of y'all. Uh, I've been asked to make a quick presentation before we get to our main presentation. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this or have gotten copies of this yet, but this is a, a book entitled Many Winters Waiting. It was written by Evan Wilson and was just printed. Uh, it's, it's just come out. Evan was here six or seven or eight years. I, he was here for quite a while working on the Oregon Inlet Jetty Project back a few years ago and uh, kept very great, good notes, all this, and he has done the research and put his, his time here in Dare County working on the Jetty Project, he's put it in print. And we want to present this today uh, to Moon. Uh, it has been signed, Moon, by everyone that's attended today. Moon is mentioned throughout this thing, uh, as are other folks from, uh, from the area, but Moon is mentioned throughout this thing, and Moon, we thought this would be a nice gift for you today. So if you want to... <laughs> Thank all of y'all for signing that for him. Uh, I would like to um, have the chairman of our board of commissioners come up, Mr. Warren Judge, for our main presentation. Thank you, Bob. You know, uh, Bob was talking about uh, and told a story, and Jerry did a, a great job about <coughs> Moon talking to the Moon, and it really kind of tied uh, things together for me. Several years ago, I was in Washington on a trip with Moon and and Bob, and we had quite a few others. <coughs> and, and I tell you, if you ever need to go to Washington, and if you um, want to get around well. Bob Peel's the man to take you, because not only does he know the halls of Congress wells well, but he pushes a mean wheelchair. <laughs> but uh, Moon, uh, <clears throat> we had spent a day talking with uh, senators and congressmen, and uh, I asked Moon what he thought. He said, Warren, I could have just been home talking to the Moon as well as talking to these fellows here. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, really rang, it really rang true for me today. <clears throat> Bobby... Um, Bobby mentioned that um, the Oregon Inlet Jetty effort has been underway for 66 years. And um, I knew that, Bobby, but I probably had forgotten it. And uh, it, <laughs> right, I wasn't even born. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it really kind of dampened my spirits because I've thought the 12 years that I've been working on it has been long. But, um, but it's... Uh, it's an effort, one of so many efforts that, that uh, Moon has been involved with. It is certainly my privilege, and it's an honor to be here today to be asked to, to make this uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> there are, um, this community, this county of ours is, is just the most wonderful place to live. And whether you were born here or whether you have moved here, uh, it, is, there's a uniqueness about it. It's a uniqueness about our people, how caring and giving we are, the entrepreneurial spirit that we all have and possess. And it's, uh, it, like I said, it is absolutely an honor for me to be received into this community the last 25 years like I have been and um, to stand before you today. <clears throat> uh, the Living Legends Committee has certainly, has certainly, made an excellent choice, and as Mike Murray, um, or no, excuse me, as Will pointed out, um, <clears throat> there's something special about uh, Moon's uh, selection at this time. Uh, 
the industry that he loves, as Jerry has recounted to you so eloquently, the industry that has called him and has been his life is honored along with him. You cannot separate the two. You cannot separate fishing from Moon Tillet. And that industry today is under such siege by federal regulation and the special interest groups. And it is just so fitting that we make this presentation today and that we do honor Moon Tillett and that possibly this will be uh, a springboard for a renewed effort on all of our parts to fight back this strangulation that is ruining our culture and our heritage that Moon loves so dearly as do all of y'all in this room, those that have come before us and those that will go beyond us. Moon, it is indeed my pleasure today to present this to you on behalf of the, uh, on behalf of the committee. That's okay. After today, do you like to head inch a lot? After today, you make everybody bring it to you. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought there for a second. I'll get it back here in just a minute. But it is indeed, it is indeed an honor. We are Dare County, your family, your friends, the industry. We are better off. We are better today. Because Moon Tillett has walked through Dare County. Because Moon Tillett has left footprints in the sand in Dare County. Because Moon Tillett has taken boats in and out through Oregon in Dare County. Moon, you are a giant among us. What the legacy that you're leaving us is one that hopefully we all will be worthy to carry on. In your honor, as you have showed us. And again, it is my pleasure to present to you the Living Legends Award for 2012 on behalf of everybody. I didn't know I did all this. <laughs> on the program. 20? Yes, sir. <laughs> With two words. <laughs> I want to thank everybody. That's about all I can do. I can't talk like Jerry. <laughs> but I helped him out. He talked for me. There you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I, I'm hoping Moon and Miss Jean will hang around for a few moments to let everybody speak to them. And thank y'all for coming. We appreciate it.